Welcome everyone that's in the room. I'm so excited to see so many of you. It's just great. And thanks to Marilyn for bringing the seed board and Dennis for help wagging the seed board back. And it, I mean, it's nothing says NIPSOP meeting in person like having that seed board back with the seeds on it. So you guys, if you gathered some seed, bring them to next month's seed board, okay? It's a community project. We've got a flat of nice looking four inch blue bonnets back there. Everybody get one. If you got four or five at the last meeting, you might hold back and let people that weren't at the meeting get one. Um, and then uh, our vice president, um, Christy has got seeds for sale collected out at Berry Springs back there too. So, all right. First thing, here's our uh, field trip schedule. As you see, our field trip committee is very, very busy and they've got lots of uh, plans for us this Sunday. And yes, we do know it's Super Bowl Sunday and <laughs> most of you longtime NITSOP members could like me, you could care less if it's Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> And you feel good going out on a field trip on Super Bowl Sunday. Okay. Um, we'll have a good time. And the detail, we meet at 1.30. It's on a Sunday afternoon, but it's time. So, and you'll see more details on the website. Okay. Then we're going to visit the golf site to kind of do a, it's a plant survey. It's, it's a site that we surveyed in years past. And we're going to kind of update that. They've asked us to come out and look. They've, um, you know, they think there's some changes and so forth. And I think there's no longer livestock grazing on where it was in the past. So they've asked us to come out and look. So if you ever wanted to go see the world famous ecology, uh, archaeological site, the golf site, this is your chance. So, um, then we have our big field trip to Native American Sea in April. And new plan is for uh, May is the Lake Waco wetlands. Barbecue lunch. No, that's not on the slide. That's optional. And then if you want to, to go to the Waco Mammoth National Monument afterwards, we're giving you a time. You know, we'll we'll tell you what time we're going to start at Waco. But right now we're planning to depart Georgetown at 8 a.m. We're not doing carpool or anything like that because, you know, it's a new world. So and some of you don't want to drive to Georgetown, turn around and drive to Waco because you already live halfway to Waco. <laughs> All right. And then we have uh, another plant survey in June at Hidden Springs and another one in August, another one in December. But I will tell you, because I was privy to their meeting Tuesday night, they've got other things in the works too for the coming months. They do a good job. All right. The big one, the biggie is the plant sale, Saturday, March 26th at the pavilion at Berry Springs, same place it was last time. So, 10, to 3. 10 to three. Sorry, I didn't get the new hours on it. Same time as before. We will try not to be sold out at 10.05. Don't <laughs> you know, keep, stop beating me up about that first time, okay? <laughs> last time I had plants left over, so. <laughs> I don't plan for that to happen again. <laughs> All right, upcoming programs. Uh, next month, we're gonna do our homegrown landscaping with native plant program with yards and pieces of property around Williamson County. And then I'm excited about April 14th. If y'all have not heard Gil Eckert, native plants for the bird, he's awesome. And then Chris Ebling is gonna do a tree identification techniques program in May. If you've got an idea, share it with Susie Hickman or share it with me. All right, things coming up on a state. Statewide will be the Spring Symposium, March 5th. It's a fundraiser for the Nipsot and Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, which we support. Um, I think we've already got an announcement on our blog for it, don't we? We do, yes, we do. So you can go there and see how much it costs, but it's a it's all virtual with a virtual tour of the Wildflower Center at the end. Huh? You tired of virtual? <laughs> well, I still prefer virtual to driving to the other end of Austin. 
just so. All right. The Native Landscape Certification Program Level 1, Austin is offering it, and that is a good one for our area, for Williamson County. So if you would like to, and you can take, um, you have to take Level 1 before you can take any of the others. So if you can gag down virtual one more time, okay, <laughs> and go down to the Wildflower Center for the plant walks at your appointed time, because they do it that way, I think we will be having some of the other levels offered from up here. Okay, so in the future, maybe before 2023 rolls in. So. Okay, this is where we are and how you find us. Well, we're on Instagram too. I don't know how many of y'all are on Instagram. It's all on our webpage. So. All right, tonight we're giving away a really cool book. Um, how to Grow Native Plants in Texas in the Southwest. It is the one that Barbara recommended. It was published in 1986. So you're not gonna find it for $25.99 on Amazon, okay? And if you went, the Zoomers, we'll draw the Zoomers and we'll draw from in here and it will be shipped to you, okay? And it will be a used copy, right? And when you go look at a price of a new one, you'll understand why we're sending you You'll be glad we're not wasting your dues. So <laughs> a new copy. So plan to do live and Zoom for the, and that you are being recorded if you step up in front of the camera or speak. All right, I am so excited to have our speaker tonight. And I think this crowd has a lot to do with our speaker. Who we have is Barbara Wright, Wright's Nursery and Briggs. And she is our number one supplier for our native plant sale. I'm just gonna let you go at it. I've got the mouse on the advance right there. Okay. So you can just tap that. Okay. All right. And you're running into trouble. <laughs> okay. Um, I called this still learning how to propagate native plants because it seems like every time I think I get something figured out, something happens. Um, it, it just never seems to fail. This has been one of those years. Uh, stuff is coming up and going along good. Um, we had Carolina wrens in the greenhouse and they always love the seeds, but they've never, they've always preferred pepper seeds, hot pepper seeds to anything else. Um, but for some reason this year they switched around and then we also had rats in the greenhouse. <laughs> so it, it has been, a struggle this year just beyond other things. Um, this is gonna be kind of general. I'm not gonna talk a lot in specifics, uh, but we'll get started here. Okay, I wanna start with gathering and storing seeds. Um, it's always a good idea. A lot of people want to gel seeds to me that have been stored in a plastic bag, um, or I've had people put the silica gel things in with them to to keep the moisture out. That's okay, but it's not really the best thing you can do. The cheapest thing you can do to store seeds, these envelopes that come in your bills that nobody uses anymore. Um, that's the best way. Paper will uh, let the moisture out, keep the seeds from molding. Um, and it's just, you can write on it where you got the seeds from, what the plant is, when you got them, things like that. Okay, back to my slide now since I got off track. So if you plan to collect seeds, if you've been watching a plant and you wanna collect seeds from that plant, if we have a real dry period while it's trying to produce that seed, take it some water. Um, go ahead, keep it hydrated if you can, because that's gonna help you get a better quality seed. Um, it's gonna be more likely to germinate. In wild areas, always leave some seed for the critters. Uh, it's their food. It's gonna continue producing more plants, which will produce more seeds, which will just keep going, keep things going. Research the plant. The, the seed uh, on the, uh, a lot of the daisy-like plants, the seed is in the center. Seeds in the Asteraceae family, the seed is in the center. Well, you look at a Blackfoot daisy, and most people are gonna assume that seed is in the center. That seed's not in the center. The, the seed on a blackfoot daisy is actually underneath the petals. Okay. 
<clears throat> so not all seed is where you think it's going to be. Then um, I talked already about the plastic storage. You can use plastic storage to get rid of the bugs because sometimes when you collect seeds, they're going to be full of weevils of one kind or another, um, no matter how small the seed is. Ricky Lennox brought me a bunch of Monarda fistulosa seed, and there were as tiny as it is, little pinpricks of seeds. There were even tinier bugs in there. So you can put it in plastic, put it in the freezer, get rid of the bugs, but then move it into paper. Uh, label your seeds. You're gonna forget what they are, okay? Everybody does. My husband is really, really bad about this. Um, if you don't know what it is, take a picture of the plant as well as the seeds. It's really hard to identify seeds just from a picture of the seeds. Um, if necessary, put something in the photo to give it some scale. Your hand, uh, so just something to give us an idea of size because that'll help us with identifying the seeds. Okay. Um, the Wildflower Center years ago told me they would like to always know the history of the plant, where it came from, what kind of soil it was on. So as much as you can, collect that information as well. It's not critical, but it's just one of those things they like to have. Okay, we're gonna talk about germination. Um, what do seeds need to germinate? They need light, some of them need darkness. Some, some seeds need to be on the surface of the soil. Some seeds need to be underneath the soil. They need, seeds need water and they need temperature. And when you're talking about temperature to germinate seeds, they're talking about soil temperatures. A lot of people will come to me and say, such and such didn't come up and it's 80 degrees today. That doesn't mean your soil temperature is 80 degrees. It may have to be 100 degrees outside before your soil temperature is approaching 80 degrees. Okay. Conversely, all of those things can cause poor germination. Too much light or not enough light, too much darkness, too much water, and then high or low soil temperatures can cause things not to do. This is kind of where you have to, you have to be observant, uh, keep an eye on your seeds, once, especially once you put them in the ground. Um, think about when and where that plant grows. If that plant is doing most of its growing in August, then it probably doesn't want to be planted in March or in February. Um, okay, stratification, this is, this is part of germination. You usually think of it as cold treatment. It can be, but it can also be cold and moist or it can be alternating cycles. Um, rusty black awe needs two periods of cold, two winter cycles interrupted by a summer cycle, 14 to 16 months to germinate. That's why you don't see a lot of rusty black awe viburnums in trade. There, there are a few people out there that do them, that produce them, but uh, yeah, you're throwing away too early. Put them in that pot and leave them alone. <laughs> um, this is also just over 116 little bitty rusty black hole viburnums in last year's freeze. Um, we won't have those again probably for three years. We got very few seed last year because of that freeze. And until we get a good amount of seed and wait almost two years, we're not going to have any more. So that's why they've been hard to find. A lot of things are hard to find for similar reasons. Scarification, uh, because of the double dormant seed coats that a lot of native seeds have, because they're gonna sit there and wait for the right conditions and the right time, a lot of these need scarification. Birds and small animals do it naturally. I've threatened many times to just you know get a bird, start feeding it these seeds and then plant the newspaper because <laughs> that would be a very efficient way of getting seeds scarified. 
and they do it with the, the stomach acid, but also birds have a crop uh, in their throats that gets that stuff off. You can do it manually. It can't, it's not always easy. Uh, mountain laurels are one that needs scarification. Um, I use coffee. Coffee is a slightly acidic thing. Hot coffee I use for the astrolochia, the, uh, the pipe vines. And I soak those about 48 hours and I put hot coffee on them, drain them after a couple of hours, more hot coffee and keep doing that. And that seems to aid in germination. And that's just, uh, you know, I can't give you scientific evidence, but it just seems to improve the germination of those. Or, I have a question about that real quick. You know, Jill Noakes' book, speaking of that one, you know, she, she refers to a lot of these acid treatments. Mm -hmm. Well, where does one get acid? You know, drain your battery? <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, kind of, yes. Okay, yeah. He's, uh, he's asking about where to get the acids that it, Jill Noakes mentions in her book. Um, one of the acids that I know are, is used for scarification is gabrylic acid. The only source we know for gabrylic acid is in California, one man. And there may be more by now, but there was at the time only one man. Muratic acid that you treat concrete with, yeah. you dilute it, yeah. it's available at... Yeah, pool, pool stores should have muratic acid as well. Um, but yeah, we use sulfuric acid to treat our water with, to bring our water to a neutral pH or slightly acidic pH. And where do you get it? The auto parts store. Okay. <laughs> um, we buy it in five gallon containers, but you can probably buy it less. And, you know, if you've got an old battery, you might try that. She Just be careful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry? Most batteries are sealed. Most batteries are sealed. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, it's uh, we we dilute it way down, but we have used that to scarify seeds as well, the battery acid. So. And sulfuric acid is battery acid, and it's it's already diluted when you get it for use in car batteries. It's already been diluted. I forget what percentage it is. But, um, you can also use files. My husband uses the grinding wheel. He takes the alamovine seeds and. He's much better coordinated than I am, so he just touches them to that grinding wheel and pulls it off. And he's so far he hasn't left, left any skin behind, as far as I know. <laughs> okay, soils. This this is important, especially in our soils here. Um, I don't really recommend trying to start seeds in the ground most of the time. We just have too much clay in the soil. And personally, I think this, the clay in the soil contributes to a lot of things like West Texas things and South Texas things that I can grow here in pots, but I can't grow them in the ground. And I think it's because that clay soil, as the soil dries out, it creates fissures in the soil. As it gets wet again, then those fissures close up. I think that constant movement of soil is not good on some of the roots of some of the plants. Some of the plants that are used to a more a sandier soil of West Texas or South Texas, um, that soil is going to move some, but not like our clay soils move. So I don't recommend planting most of the seeds in the ground. It's easier to start them in pots for the most part. And Usually you're going to have less predation, less birds and small mammals and things. You know, you'll wonder what happened to your seeds and all of a sudden you see a little pile of them over here where the Carolina wren has dumped them off. Um, they're, they're really, Carolina wrens are really, really bad. Uh, so for most seeds, smaller seeds especially, we use a, a commercially bagged mix. I, when we started doing this, I got a bag of every soilless mix that I could find from my supplier and use them until I determined what worked best for us. Um, what I'm using right now is a brand called Jolly Gardener. Um, it's a really fine, I didn't bring any with me tonight, but it's a really fine soil mix. I'll show you if you wanna to come to the nursery and see. And um, I, don't, I don't put the seeds usually into the soil. 
I usually just put the seeds on top. That's what mother nature does. Um, eventually as you water, it's gonna wash some soil over those seeds, but that makes this light enough, light weight enough that it's gonna still allow some uh, penetration of the light. Okay, light, larger seeds like the mountain laurel, like the rusty black hob viburnum, they go into a coarser mix, a mix that we make there at the nursery. When we started this about 20 some odd years ago, there was a standard nursery mix of 40% peat, 40% compost and 20% sand. We've modified that a little bit. We're using screened granite sand in place of just regular sand. It seems to add a lot more nutrients and it may have, it may have some scarification effect. Um, just using that in there, but it does seem to have more nutrients. Okay, think about container sizes. Um, in the nursery, in the greenhouses, we use cell trays. That's the main reason for that is greenhouse space is valuable. You're heating and cooling that space in most cases. Uh, you're adding light. You want to use it as efficiently as possible. So you're putting a lot of seeds in a little 10 by 12, 10 by 20 inch space. Um, I really don't like to work with some of the smaller uh, 512 cells to a, in a 10 by 20 space because that's a lot of cross-eyed trying to get the seeds in the right holes. That's not easy to do. I generally stick to uh, 72 count or 128 count or 200 cells to that same space. Um, the other reason for using cell trays, as opposed to trying to start seeds in one gallon pots or four inch pots, a lot of people think that's the way we do it. You're gonna drown a seed. Um, I have seen experienced gardeners trying to start tomato seeds in a four inch pot and they just drown the seed because they're, they're thinking that water will help and water is only a help up to a point where it becomes detrimental to the plant. Um, yes, ma'am. Have you used the deep cell trays? And okay. what's your experience with that? I've, I've used some deep cell trays. Um, and you may, I, I don't know if I have a picture in here or not, but yeah, it depends on the seed. It depends on whether it has a tap root or not. Things that have the tap root, if possible, you want to allow them to grow that tap root as deep as it can. Otherwise the tap root goes in circles and it may not, may not make a viable plant. And do you so. bump them up to a one gallon? Because the others? Yeah, it, it depends. Um, sometimes a one gallon, sometimes a three gallon. Okay. There, um, okay, I can't think of his name. It's a professor out of Oklahoma who actually developed a kind of a formula. Uh, he, he developed, he's the gentleman that developed the root maker pots. He actually goes from a four inch container, roughly a four inch container to a three gallon container to a 15 gallon container. So each time you're increasing the size around by about four inches. So, um, but that's mostly for woody stuff, mostly for woody materials, trees, shrubs, things like that. But that's his, one of the, one of the things that he came up with. Um, Okay, yeah, balance the size of your seeds to the size of your container. Right now, the, the deep cell, uh, cell trays that you were asking me about, we have, um, okay, I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> well, we've got Mexican Buckeyes in some. Uh, no, we did, we did the Anacocha Orchids and root maker trays. Um, We've got some Blanco cher cherries in the deep cells. Uh, I have got something else in the deep cells. I can't yeah, think what it is. Yeah, yeah, those are in those, I believe. Well, some of the milkweeds are in the deeper. Yeah, a lot of people recommend that for those deeper cells. I'm not sure that how much of a benefit that is for the milkweeds because you have to leave them in there a long time for it to get to be able to pull that cell out and retain the, retain the soil. Um, because they have that tap root, they don't have a lot of root hairs. A lot of times when you pull those out, 
that soil falls away. The monarch so. watch milkweeds they ship went from that deep cell to a short cell sometime in the last couple of years, four, years. five years yeah, yeah. Okay. so now they're in a 72 okay plug tray and they were in the right 50 count deep yeah yeah and that's that's one of the about probably <laughs> <laughs> okay, Beth, Beth was mentioning that uh, Monarch Watch has changed the way that they were doing it. They were using the 50 count deep cell trays to do the milkweeds, and they have recently switched to the uh, 72 count, about two inch each and a half, two inch deep cell trays. And that may be because it wasn't holding, because the last time I got some Monarch Watch plugs, you know, when we pulled those out, we lost a lot of soil around them. And it's not, you know, it's not a good thing for the roots. Okay, so yeah, watch, you know, balance the size of your seeds to the size of your container. Um, when transplanting from cell trays to larger containers, keep in mind how fast a plant can grow. You don't, there's no point in putting the plant from a from a cell tray, from a 72 count cell tray into a four inch, if it's gonna stay there three weeks and you gotta plot it up to one gallon. Um, and that just take, kind of takes ex experience, learning what grows. Um, the other thing I will tell you is that in spring, everything grows faster. Um, I don't know what it is about spring, if it's a light, if it's a combination, but in, you know, in spring, things just seem to grow faster than they do other times of year. There we go. Okay, there's that's a 200 count cell tray, and that uh, those are big red sage uh, seedlings in those. Um, and that gives you the approximate size of the cells and about how deep they are. Big red sage is something that we have much better luck when we're using fresh seed. I usually go ahead and pull the the stalks, the seed heads, put them upside down in a paper bag, let them dry for a few days to a week or so then just take and just beat the heck out of that bag and that will shake loose those seeds then you can dump your seeds out and go ahead and plant them and there will be some of those at the sale both in one gallons and four inch i assume i have them both ways okay we're still talking about germination here water and watering um, over watering is the easiest way to kill seedlings and cuttings both especially like right now when we're having low night temperatures, when we have cloudy days, you can really kill a seedling fast. Um, Water is the most difficult thing to manage. It's probably the hardest thing to learn in the nursery industry. Years ago, my first intern told me he didn't want to water because the first sentence in the first textbook he had said that the man behind the hose is the man who dictates the profits of the nursery. I said, you're gonna to learn to water anyway. <laughs> um, it, I've, I've had other people want to come to work for me and tell me they don't want to water. Everybody waters in my nursery, everybody waters. It's a good skill to learn, but it's also, you really, it's, without learning how to water, it's really hard to get a feel for what the plants actually need. Uh, of course, additional, you know, we're in Texas. Uh, today it was 72 degrees outside and it was 97.5 in one of my greenhouses. You have to keep that in mind. You can't really, if you're trying to germinate, don't, don't put a bunch of seeds in a cell tray and, and go on vacation next week. <laughs> Not going to work. Um, to do this, you kind of, you have to have a little bit of commitment. Check your seedlings frequently. Um, and it's, it's gonna say this in one of my later slides. Don't just look at the top. If you're using a cell tray or another container, lift it up and look at the bottom. They can be dry underneath and that soil on top can look wet. If you can't do that, stick your finger in it. Get, get your finger dirty, get dirt under your fingernail, stick your finger in it. You want to have moisture about an inch or so down. 
It doesn't have to be wet, wet, but you should have some little brown crumbs sticking to your finger when you come back out of that soil if, you're, if your soil's wet, uh, about, a deep, about an inch down. And in the greenhouse this time of year, there have been years where I had to water seedlings about every hour and a half, give or take, just a light watering. So I can't go very far either. How are you watering? Uh, we use a, what, a breaker on a wand, a three foot wand with what's referred to as a breaker, which is the head that has all the holes in it. And I use a lemon head or a red head dram breaker. And uh, I think the red head has 800 holes in it. So it breaks it up into a fairly fine thing. I'm not, you know, not hitting it with a bunch of water. I try not to get it full pressure until the plants are larger. Uh, and my husband fussed at me one day for doing that. And I said, well, if I put them out in the rain, they're gonna get beaten to death. So they need to get used to it now. <laughs> you know, so you do, you do have to, you have to make that plant work for it, I guess is what I'm gonna say. Um, you can't, it's not gonna do any good if you keep a plant in the greenhouse and you're, you're babying it and giving it everything you needs. And then you're setting it out in the wind all of a sudden and it's gonna go. You know, it's just, it's not gonna be able to cope with. So you have to harden it off if you wanna, if you wanna name it. That's, that's the name for the process they use of, for instance, if you're doing tomatoes, set them outside for an hour, bring them back in. Tomorrow, do it for two hours and bring them back in. And that's gonna help harden those plants off, make them more accustomed to the rain, the wind, the sun. So, um, uh, light. Most commercial greenhouses use shade cloth. Uh, I have one of my houses has 40% shade. The other one has about 60% shade. Helps regulate heat. It can knock heat off. It can knock probably 40 degrees off in my house with 60 degree with the 60% shade cloth. Um, it also prevents sun damage. It helps keep your seedlings more evenly moist. But you can do, you can germinate seeds without having a greenhouse. Everybody does it. A lot of people does it. Not everybody, but a lot of people do it. Um, dappled shade is going to be the best thing you can get because that way they're going to get some of everything. They're going to get some sunlight. They're going to get some shade. It's going to, they're not going to dry out as fast because they are getting some shade. It's, uh, they're going to get some wind exposure, hopefully, which the wind exposure helps increase the stem strength of almost any plant. Um, the sun, of course, helps with nutrient production. Inside, if you're trying to raise inside, you're almost going to have to have supplemental lighting. Um, it's rare to find a house that's well lit enough to raise plants in. Uh, and if you have a sunroom, I've had a few people with sunrooms and they get hot enough, it can be hot, uh, hard to raise plants in there as well. Uh, also indoors, using a fan in combination with the light is going to help. And you don't have to have the fancy lights. You can if you want to, if you want to invest that much. Um, but ordinary, everyday fluorescent lights will do the same thing. Okay, fertilizer. Don't use miracle grow soils for seedlings. It's, you're gonna get very weak, very tall, spindly seedlings. Uh, the commercial germinating soil that I use does not have any fertilizer in it at all. That seed contains everything that that seedling needs for until it gets its second set of true leaves. So just, just don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, once they have two sets of true leaves, we use generally a diluted liquid fertilizer, usually an organic, but not always. And then once we pot up to a larger container, a four inch container, we use a time release fertilizer, Osmoco generally. I've tried other time release fertilizers and they don't work as well for me as Osmoco does. And we generally don't use full strength fertilizer until the plant is going into a four inch or larger pot. Some of the commercial growers do, 
but that's up to them. That's, that's not my way of doing it. Um, it's real easy to over fertilize a plant. I can probably actually, you know, guess at who is using fertilizer just by looking at the plants. You know, if they're, if they're forcing blooms in March when something doesn't usually bloom till April or May or June, they're probably using fertilizer trying to force it. Um, and that's, again, that's okay. Okay, asexual propagation. Um, and that's just a fancy word for propagating without the plant being pollinated. And the main three ways of doing this are cuttings, and you can do either plant cuttings, um, stem cuttings, or root cuttings. I have had some success with root cuttings, but I didn't cover it this time. Uh, division is probably one of the oldest methods of asexual propagation around, and it's been done for hundreds of years. Uh, and tissue culture is one of the newest. Okay, the reasons you wanna do cuttings. There are advantages to doing cuttings over using seeds. Um, propagating from cuttings can fool the plant into thinking it's more mature. This is, for instance, wisteria, some of the other vines you're talking from a seed, you can grow them from seed, but it may take eight years or more for that vine to bloom. Wisteria, Chinese wisteria in particular is known for this. Um, so that's a reason to do cuttings on some things because the plant thinks that it is older than it is. The other reason for using cuttings, if it, for in, as a general rule, if it is a patented plant, it's being done from cuttings. Um, knockout roses are done from cuttings, all knockout roses. Until they develop a new one, the new ones are done from seed, but that can take four to five years to know that you have a viable plant doing that from seed. Uh, cathedral oaks, that's a live oak that has a really nice upright shape. Uh, those are done from cuttings. There are a lot of plants out there that are done from cuttings. So those are the reasons for doing cuttings but there is no genetic diversity or very little genetic diversity when you start doing cuttings. So you lose, you gain some things, you lose other things. Um, cuttings are also used to produce female trees or shrubs so that you have uh, berries or other fruit on shrubs. Okay. Once again, to do cuttings, pick out a plant to do cuttings. Water the plant. I'll sometimes water them two or three times because that's going to help that plant retain energy in the pieces you're cutting off of it. So either water it or wait until we get a good soaking rain and then get your cuttings. Research the plant. This is where Jill Noak's book comes in a lot uh, a lot of information in here. It's going to tell you if it's uh, a tip cutting, a stem tip cutting, if it's semi hardwood or hardwood cuttings, how long a cutting is recommended. Most roses, for instance, they recommend a four to six inch cutting. That's really, to me, that's too long. Uh, that's too large. That's too much growth or too much energy that that piece of plant is using to sustain itself and it's not going to do, it's not gonna root as well as it should or as fast as it should. Um, as a general rule, take the cuttings when the plant is growing, not when the plant's dormant in late summer here. We actually, here in Texas, if you don't know, we for the most part have two dormant periods. So late summer, July, August, those plants are dormant. They look nice and green but they're not actively growing. Uh, and again, of course, they're dormant in winter. So for the most part, you're gonna do your cuttings in the mid to late spring, early summer, and then early to mid fall before those plants go dormant again. Okay. Try to assemble your tools before you take your cuttings. You don't want those cuttings sitting around any longer than necessary. Um, a knife or an X-Acto blade, it depends on what you've, what you've learned. 
Um, I generally use pruning shears and scissors, but I've noticed, I've talked to a lot of other people that use different methods. Clean your tools, make sure they're sharp, lubricate your tools. You can just use plain old olive oil or any cooking oil to lubricate pruning shears. They work much better. Your hands don't get nearly as tired. <laughs> um, get your containers ready, your whatever media you're using. And I have had acquaintances who have used just straight perlite to root cuttings. Um, one of my acquaintances used a just a, a dish tub, basically, to uh, full of full of um, perlite. She flooded it once a day. It had holes in the bottom. It drained out, and that's all she did. And she was using that for rose cuttings and rosemary cuttings and other kinds of cuttings. And it worked well for her. Um, we usually do the cuttings. We stick the cuttings into potting soil, and I use a medium grade potting soil that drains well for that. Uh, you don't want something that's gonna hold a lot of water. Okay, you also want rooting hormone, whether it's powder or liquid. Mostly what we use is Hormodin 2, which is a powder. It also comes in Hormodin, Hormodin 2, Hormodin 3, which is for evergreens. There's also, I can't think of, I can see the bottle almost, but I can't think of the name of it. There are liquids, but that's a personal preference. I just haven't had as much luck with the liquids as I have with the powders. Um, the liquid, of course, you can dilute to any strength you need. Uh, again, that's something you need to look up because it's gonna be, it's gonna suggest whether it's hard to root or not, and that's gonna make a difference on what strength you're gonna use. Keep the cuttings, you don't wanna put the cuttings out in full sun or full wind. You need, they need to be protected. Um, we use heat mats and time misters on a timer. You only use the misters during daylight hours. You don't miss them at night, um, but you can do that. I've, I've had people have success with cuttings, just setting the tray out in a protected place in the garden and watching it, keeping it moist and just watching over it. Remember people did this a hundred years ago back before there were a lot of things. Okay, shaping the cuttings. Um, I should have had a picture here, but I did not, I apologize. Um, I normally use a four inch or shorter piece of cutting. You cut below a node. A node is where the leaves come out. Um, depending on what you've got, your nodes may be several inches apart. Coral honeysuckle, your nodes can be four or six inches apart. Um, but for most things, it's closer than that. Remove the leaves from the bottom node or the, any, any nodes that are gonna be below the soil level. And one thing I was told years ago, don't poke that all the way to the bottom of your pot, whatever, whatever you're using for cuttings. Don't poke, you don't want it all the way at the bottom of the pot. You want it about in the middle of the pot. So if you're, if you're using a cell tray, it's got an inch and a quarter inch deep, you're gonna put them about three quarters of an inch down. You're gonna trim off the leaves, especially something that has large leaves. Uh, doing American Beauty Berries. We'll trim off all the lower leaves and then the, we'll leave a couple of larger leaves, but only parts of those leaves. We'll cut them down in about a half or maybe a third. You don't want that energy that is left in that stem going to support those leaves. You want that energy left in that stem trying to produce roots. So almost always the leaves are trimmed. Um, vines, for the most part, will root between the nodes. Not all of them, but most of them will. But I still have better luck using the nodes when I'm trying to root vines. And vines don't care which way is up. Uh, most of the other stuff will. Try to keep it, when I'm, when I'm doing cuttings, I try to lay them all in the same direction so that the bottom is towards me and the top is away from me. You can also, if you're working with cactus or plumeria or some of the other things doing cuttings, put an arrow on it. The arrow will indicate which way is up and then put that base in the soil. Um, dip the bottom of the cutting into the rooting hormone, whether you're using liquid or, or not. 
because I use the hormone powder rather than the liquid, I usually make a hole first in my cells to put that, that stem down into, and that way you're not knocking all that powder off. I have talked to a lot of other people. Um, one place was used, they were dipping their cuttings in vodka and then into the powder. The, the powder dissolves in alcohol. It doesn't dissolve in water. So that's why they were doing that. Well, that's one of the reasons they were doing that. The, uh, the vodka also sterilizes the plant to a certain extent any diseases that might be on the end of that plant. Um, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. I know people who double dip, they dip in a liquid rooting hormone and then into the powder. And then there are plants that don't need any hormone. Um, not any native specifically that I can think of, but ice plant, uh, some of the other things, I don't use hormones on those, just stick them. And I know I'm talking about non-natives, but I'm just trying to give you examples. Have you tried roasted black haws or uh, Carolina buckthorns? Um, we've tried Carolina buckthorns, but not recently. Uh, rusty black haws, we've never tried doing from cuttings. Yeah, our, our tree, our shrub is only probably now big enough to do that. Um, we have tried mountain mahogany from both cuttings and seeds, and we've had Good luck one time with cuttings. We cut off an entire lower limb because it was in the way, it was running into our parking lot. And that was the best luck we ever had with cuttings on mountain mahogany. But we lost those last year too. <laughs> last year was a hard year. Okay, now this is where patience comes in because you just gotta wait. You gotta keep watering them. You've got to keep them a little bit protected. You don't want the cuttings to get completely dry. Any peat moss, any peat moss based soil mix, if you let it get completely dry, you may never get it wet again. It just, it, it compacts. It is really, really hard. You just have to set it in water and walk away and let it soak up water. And by that time, of course, your plant, by the time it's dried completely, it may be dead. Um, don't, get, don't get them too wet. It's okay if you're gonna go off and leave for a day, give them a little extra water, leave, come back, check them. If they need water, water them. If they're still wet on the top and the bottom, walk away, leave them alone again for a little while. And like I said, patience is required. This cuttings can take several weeks to a couple of months, sometimes more, more longer than that. Yeah, sorry, can't talk. At about the three week mark, and always, always mark your cuttings because once they lose your leaves, their leaves, you're not going to remember what they are. <laughs> so mark your cuttings, um, mark a date on there too, so you'll know about when. And this, if you're organized enough to do it, keep records, keep records of when you started, keep records of when you saw the first few roots and when you were able to remove them from the trays. Um, but check for roots by picking that container up and looking underneath. Don't try to pull the plants out. You're breaking off those really fragile roots. Okay, about the same time you start seeing white roots, as soon as that plant gets, starts getting nutrients through those roots, you should start seeing some new growth on top. On, on, uh, I'm talking on top of the so soil, the soil surface. Okay, this is Greg's dahlia that uh, Randy brought out a bunch of cuttings of. And you can see in the picture where we had started them, you can see the top, and then you can see the one little white root down here at the bottom. And I think in that picture, there are probably also other roots, but most of that's gonna be perlite. So we did about roughly 400 cuttings of Greg's dahlia. Uh, we potted up recently about 224 inch pots. So we lost about half of those. I kind of think it was, well, they, I, know for, I know from doing them in the past, they do better in the heat of the summer. So it was partially the colder temperatures that got them. Um, and I expect out of those 220, I expect to probably lose another 30 or 40 more. So it's not, 
It's not guaranteed by any means, especially not with native plants. The plants that are more used by people, um, the plants that are more decorative, the scientists have it down very, 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 very explicitly how long it's gonna to take to germinate, what percentage is gonna germinate, how long it's gonna to take to get it to a specific size. But nobody has studied native plants enough yet to get that kind of information. So it's just not out there. We need somebody to keep more track of that. That's one of the things about Jill Noak's book. Jill didn't go out and grow this stuff herself. Jill sent out questionnaires to various people in the nursery industry that were working with native plants and they sent her back information. So a lot of what's in Jill's book is colloquial evidence. It's not formal evidence. It's not formal science. It's just someone's experience. Everybody has a little bit different experience. So my experience is gonna be a little bit different from yours. Yours may be better than from mine. Um, that's one of the ways that I learn stuff is by talking to other people. And this Jill Noakes book was a huge thing when it came out in the industry because this was even 23 or 24 years ago when we started doing this, we would go and talk to other nursery owners and trying to get information from them was just nearly impossible. You would have to have a long conversation and try to get a little nugget of information. And then you could build on that little nugget of information maybe with somebody else. But there just wasn't a lot of this out there. People weren't talking about it. It was hard won knowledge and they were holding on to it. So, yes, ma'am. Would you spell her last name, please? N O K E S. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Propagation by division. Uh, this is probably, like I said, probably one of the earliest ways that people knew to propagate plants. I don't know at what point people started using seed, but this was something that uh, has been done for a long time. So this works better with plants that have fleshier roots or propagate by stolons, so hardly skull cap. There's no point in even trying to do that from seed, just dig some up and repot it and it's gonna grow. Um, I'm trying to think, well, there's another one, but I can't think of the name. Oh, golden ground soil is another one that's easy to split up, divide. Um, Manfredo longiflora is one that we just worked with the other day and I've got some pictures here. And the reason that picture, it's, it's long, but you can see how long that bloom spike was, almost up to the top of the screen there. Um, this is a Manfredo that's native to far South Texas, native to like three counties in South Texas, and of course, Mexico. Uh, again, water it. That water kind of helps, it gives the plant a little reserve. Um, then gather your tools. We like a spading fork to dig in our clay soil. It's much easier than trying to shovel, shovel through it. Gloves, pruning shears, scissors, containers to put your new plants in and whatever soil you're gonna use. And with this, if you wanted to, you could probably use a denser soil, but I still wouldn't use our native soil here. Mix compost with it or something to loosen it a little bit. Okay, so the first thing you do is you take that root ball that you saw on the previous screen, get some of that dirt off so that you can see better what you've got. Look for natural divisions. And I really didn't get a good picture of that. My husband was working on this as I was trying to get pictures. So I didn't get a good picture of that. But carefully, I, I use my hands as much as possible and then use pruning shears or scissors where I need to, to break those plants apart and retain as much root as you can when you're doing this. I use a knife. You use what? A knife. Oh, you use a knife, yeah. Yeah, yeah everybody's got different tools. So, And that's what they looked like when we were done. 
And I think we wound up out of that one pot that you saw, I think we wound up with 12 more pots and they are not just tiny little plants for the most part. So those should be ready, hopefully some by the spring sale. Um, again, it takes time. So give them time to root. Okay, tissue culture I haven't messed with. This is one of the newest forms of asexual propagation. Um, you can get kits if you want to play with it. You can get kits on Amazon and try it. Tissue culture is where they make genetically modified or GMO crops. They actually put the modification into the media and it's a gel media that they use in tissue culture. Those Tubes, when they're filled with a gel, will be usually kind of transparent. Um, and the reason this is used, it uses a very small amount of tissue to make a lot of plants. Um, they stack these things way high. I've seen pictures. I've not, not ever been in a lab. This is actually done in a lab, but I've seen the pictures. Yeah. But again, it's something I haven't messed with yet. Um, and let me go back, let's see, root divisions. Um, you can do, you just have to look up how to do it. Uh, we have done some root divisions on Silphium albiflora, and we've had some success with it, not a great deal, but you just do sections of the root. You leave a portion of the root either above, just above the soil surface, or just right at the soil surface. So it's getting some light, and again, just wait. And see what happens. Okay, questions? I want to say about the hormone. If you have a big jar of the hormone, put some in a separate little pill bottle or something so that you don't contaminate the other yeah. hormone. Okay, yeah, Ilsa, Ilsa is talking about because the hormone is, it's not expensive, but it's not cheap either. So yeah, and that's generally what we use is another small bottle to we put some in there and use out of that so that we're not getting dirt and other stuff in there. So. Gary's gonna give you any chat questions. Okay. Yeah, we, we do have some questions from the Zoom attendees. The first one is from Albert and Linda Cohen. This was at the beginning, uh, when we were talking about starting the season of freezer. How long do you do in the freezer? I've seen a lot of different things, but it shouldn't take long. I would say, you know, for most critters, maybe three days in the freezer. But, uh, I wouldn't leave them in there too long unless it's a seed that needs cold stratification anyway. Thank you. And then, uh, from Floyd Ewing, do you know a message board or form for native plant propagation? share discoveries and questions? That's a good question. No, I don't. Um, Facebook does have a native plant and seed exchange uh, forum. Um, and then of course, Texas Flora. And you can ask on there. I do know there is a, there are several specialized forums for milkweed seeds that have a lot of information about germination and propagation. It's like that on Facebook. This was in the discussion of the different sorts of pots that you're using. Mm -hmm. So from Patrick Cardigan, uh, what do you think about using the, the biodegradable pots? There, uh, we, I've never used, I, I've never liked the little uh, peat pots that you get. Um, I really think those are too dense. They don't root through those well. Some of the other biodegradable pots should be okay. Uh, core. I've used core as a potting material, but not the core pots. Uh, but that's core breaks down to make a nice potting soil. My problem has just been that when I was wanting to use it, you could buy little bricks or you could buy a railroad car. You, there was nothing in between. <laughs> <laughs> and getting some notes from the folks uh, online saying that I'm a little muffled, so my actual question is a little closer to that microphone. So this question came about while you were talking about cuttings. Does it matter if the plant wants to bloom after rain? I was putting its energy into that. I see so. 
sometimes we have better luck with that. Okay, the, the, um, the question was about, does it matter if when you're trying to do cuttings, if a plant is trying to bloom uh, when you're trying to do cuttings? Did I get that right, Gary? Okay. Um, sometimes what we have found, we get better results from cuttings right after a bloom than we do. It's like that extra energy they're trying to send to produce a fruit is going into the roots. Um, and that's, again, that's not scientific evidence. That's just our experience. Uh, roses certainly went back in the days when we were doing roses. Uh, we would have better luck just after the roses had a flush of bloom. All right, I've got two more uh, from Rachel. What are some environmentally responsible products that you recommend? Uh, what kind of products is she looking for? Pots or? Maybe it's specific. So maybe okay. uh, whatever the first thing that comes to mind that she could use. <laughs> There is a lot of stuff in this industry that's disposable. I try to reuse things like pots and things for as long as the pot is intact. Um, but there are a lot of growers out there that it is actually less expensive for them to buy new pots. It takes less labor to use those new pots and they dispose of them afterwards. Um, there is not a lot in the industry to me, that is really environmentally sensitive. Uh, the plastic poly that we use for the covers of the greenhouses is not really recyclable. Uh, it's considered dirty plastic. Uh, most of our pots, even though they're marked as recyclables, again, it's considered dirty plastic, so they're not really recyclable. So I just try to combat that by using them for as long as I possibly can. All right, and my last question here from Patrick Bergen. Regarding water, and some growers have said that plants do better when watered with harvested rainwater rather than groundwater and tap water. Mm -hmm. What's been your experience? Okay. Um, Patrick was asking about whether plants do better with harvested rainwater rather than groundwater. And yes, I would agree. Um, but that's the, that's the reason that we treat our groundwater. Our groundwater runs uh, as much as an 8.5, 8.8 pH in the summertime. So we bring that down to about six and a half, seven percent using sulfuric acid. Um, the acidity with, with our alkaline soil, alkaline groundwater, our plants have problems taking up the nutrients that are in the soil. Uh, all the nutrients supposedly in acidic soil are also here in our alkaline soil but the plants just can't access them as well. So the rainwater does help. Uh, the rainwater is going to have more nitrogen content. So it's going to increase that green growth. It absorbs better generally because it's a lower pH. Um, so yeah, there's, there's definite advantages to using rainwater. Okay, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Can you use uh, at your nursery? Is it uh, well water? Yes, yeah. Uh, Donna was asking if we use well water in our nursery, and we do. Yeah, I wouldn't, <laughs> knowing what I know about some of the municipal utility districts around me, I would not want to use any of their water. Um, I don't think it would be beneficial as well as it would be cost prohibitive. Okay, okay. yes, Dennis. Do you have a thought about structured water? Define structured water. Um, well, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's out in the world of biodynamics and soil energy and things like that, but somehow it's going through a venturi. I, I don't understand the physics of it. I was just curious whether you've heard of it. Uh, uh, no, uh, Dennis was asking about structured water, and I'm, that's not something I'm familiar with. I'll have to go home and look it up. Uh. <laughs> okay, good one. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. I'm going to say good night to our virtual attendees. Thank you so much for joining us. And Barbara also says thank you for listening to her. And this will be available as a recording on our YouTube channel in a few days.